All right, we're going to continue our discussion of the rules of nomenclature and the way that plants have received their names. So nomenclature is the assignment of names to plants, and these are formal scientific names we're talking about, not the common names. The way that this happens is governed by this code, the International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi, and Plants. Now, there's various versions of this code. The latest one was um, compiled or edited in Shenzhen, China, a couple years ago, and they are re-edited and reformed, re republished every six years. We'll talk about that in a second. So let's take a look at this Shenzhen code by going to its website. And here it is. It's on the web page of the International Association of Plant Taxonomists. You see their logo up there in the upper left corner. The code is published on a series of web pages. It's also available as a PDF if you wanted to download it. Here's the title page with its name. It was last revised in Shenzhen, was published on the web in 2017, and here are the members of the editorial committee. Not really the authors, but the people who have assured that it fits the form that we expect the code to be in and have incorporated any changes that were made at the meeting that took place to revise the code in Shenzhen, China. So the most important thing we can look at here, I think for us, is our principles. It's certainly worth reading some of the other sections, the preamble, etc. But we are, in a few minutes, going to go through these basic principles of the code. I'm not going to read them off to you right now because we're about to walk through them one at a time. But I wanted you to show that show you that they were here. As I say, it's also very worthwhile to take a look at this preamble and read through that. There are many other parts of the code, but for us at this introductory level, these are the most important things. So that's the Shenzhen code. Obviously, this covers, the code covers plants, algae, and fungi. That's not a big surprise because the name is in there, is right in the name of the code. Well, I've said that the code is revised every six years. There are international botanical congresses every six years. And prior to the Congress itself, there is a meeting to revise the code. Now, let me explain the Congress. The Congress is a scientific meeting, a big international scientific meeting. And scientists from all over the world can go and present their research there. These are mostly botanists, well, exclusively botanists and mainly taxonomists, but not exclusively taxonomists. So I've presented at many of these meetings. I've presented presentations at uh, my scientific research in Melbourne and in Shenzhen, China, and in um, the other international botanical congresses every six years before those dates. The next big congress will be in Brazil in 2023. Now, prior to the Congress, prior to the start of these big meetings where people present their papers, there is another meeting. And that meeting consists of basically interested people who want to go. And those interested people are the taxonomists who are concerned with how plants get their names. And they revise proposal, or that they revise, they review proposals to change the code at that meeting. And they vote on it. We'll talk in another video a little bit about how that voting takes place. But for now, just know that there is a process where people can vote on changes to the code. There's a very formal way in which those changes have to be proposed and a formal way at which they're taken up at these meetings. After the meeting is over, after the Congress is over, the editorial committee sits down and it incorporates all of the changes into the code and republishes them on the internet. And so you see, now, it's, the publication takes place quite quickly because the code was published on the internet in 2017, and the meeting also took place in 2017. In the past, it's sometimes taken a year or so to get those publications out when they had to be done on paper. Okay, so that's the changes to the International Code of Nomenclature. Well, what does it say? What are these four basic principles? And we're going to 
Actually, there's more than four basic principles. What are these basic principles? Well, the first one is that botanical nomenclature is independent of zoological and bacteriological nomenclature. So the practical effect of that is that we can have a genus of plants, a genus called Heliconia, and that's a plant. And we have a genus called Heliconia, and that's a butterfly. And this is a real example. There is really a Heliconia plant, and there is a Heliconia butterfly. So, and that's allowed. It's not prohibited by the code because they are independent nomenclatures. The zoological nomenclature and the botanical nomenclature is independent of each other. Second big principle, botanical names are ruled, determined, it says here, by nomenclatural types. And we've talked about nomenclatural types in a different video. And so these are herbarium specimens. Herbarium type specimens. So how do you know that something is a type? Well, it's going to say right on the specimen that it's a type specimen. It is designated as a type specimen. So here we have a herbarium specimen. This is a nomenclatural type specimen. And how do we know that it is? Well, we look down here, and it says right on one of the labels that it is a type. In this case, it says holotype. And we'll talk about what a holotype is in just a minute. So this is the specimen that the name is permanently associated with. And what that means, that it's permanently associated with, it means that this plant, we know that this plant, this dead plant, this dried plant that has been glued down to this piece of paper and is in a dried plant collection in a cabinet someplace in the world, we know 100% that that is this species, and in this case, Rhenialmia cardinaceae. That is the only plant in the world that we know with 100% certainty is that name, is that name plant, is Rhenialmia cardinaceae. Every other plant that we have called Rhenialmia cardinaceae, we have called it based on comparison with this plant, comparison with the DNA, comparison with the morphology, comparison with some in some way with this plant. So that's why the holotypes or the types are so important. They are the repository for the names. So all botanical nomenclature is based on that concept of type specimen. In fact, all nomenclature, zoological nomenclature, is the same. Okay, so what is this thing a holotype? Well, the holotype is the primary specimen on which the name is based. So this is the specimen that the guy who went into the field, he collected the plant, he dried it, he deposited it in a herbarium, and he then published that name, and he said, this herbarium specimen is the one that is the repository of the name. That type of type, that one, is called the holotype. It is the one we're 100% certain of. Now, I've said that other types of, other applications of the name are based on comparison. So the other types of types are not going to ever be as certain as the holotype. That we're never as certain as the holotype it is. But <clears throat> there are reasons why we might, might want other herbarium specimens associated with the name. For instance, here we have an isotype. So an isotype, it's a duplicate of the holotype. Okay, so that means this same guy who was out there in the field, a guy or a girl out there in the field, and collected the holotype and designated it as a type, same day, same place, same hands, basically they grabbed another specimen out of that same population and they pressed it, and they published it, and they published the 
um, fact that it's, you know, it's got a different collection number on it. And <clears throat> they say, this is another specimen that I collected at the same time and the same place as I collected the holotype, but now it's not the holotype. I mean, the chances of making a mistake here are un ab abominably low. I mean, we are 99.99999% certain that when this taxonomist in the field reached out a second time and grabbed a plant, they grabbed the same taxon as they grabbed the first time. But they might have made a mistake. So we call this, then, an isotype. It's almost exactly as certain as the holotype, but it's not. So if you lost the holotype, if something happened and that holotype was lost, you would want to replace it with an isotype. And you would want to designate the new isotype as the type specimen. It's, an isotype never becomes a holotype. There's only one holotype, one ever. But if it's, the holotype is lost through some catastrophe, you can designate another one by looking at the isotypes that were collected, same time, same place, same person, and say, okay, one of these now is going to serve as a type, as the type specimen. The other way that they're used, isotypes are used, is by, um, they can be sent to other parts of the country or other parts of the world. So let's say that you have your holotype and it's deposited in Costa Rica, and you think, well, someone in Russia might want to look at what this plant looks like, and so you might want to send an isotype to one of the great museums in Moscow and have it deposited there in case someone was working on this same group of plants in Moscow and they wanted to consult something. They didn't have access to the holotype, not easily anyway, and so they can consult an isotype. So we've got a couple reasons why we might want an isotype then. Basically, it's an insurance policy. If the holotype is lost, that's the first reason, you would say. And the second reason is it distributes um, a representative of the name. So it's a duplicate. And so that it can be distributed. to other herbaria. Okay, there's other types of types, syntypes. And we're again looking at this now as a taxonomist who wants to be 100% certain, certain that they have got exactly the same plant. So this is a specimen of the same species. It's collected by the same author. That's why we're pretty sure it's the same species. So it's collected by the guy or the woman who collected the holotype. So that is the author of the name, that's the person who collected the holotype. But it's from a different locality. So there they are, they're in Costa, down there in Costa Rica, they're looking into the rainforest, they find the new species, they designate the holotype, they, correct the, they collect the isotype from the same type locality, they got the holotype, and now they go to a different location on the other side of the hill or something, and they find, oh, more of the species. Let's collect a little bit of this too, that will give us a better representation of the variation in this plant, but now we're at a different locality. So it can't be the holotype, it can't be an isotype, it's got to now be called a syntype. And if you're wondering where all these things are designated, they're designated when the name is published. So after the holotype is designated, there'll be a little section then of the manuscript and it'll say, isotype, and it'll list isotypes, it'll say syntype, and a little colon, and it'll list the syntypes, and it'll list where they're deposited and what kinds of herbaria. So again, these are kind of insurance policies. So the important thing here is it's the same person, but it is not from the type locality. It's not from the place where the holotype came from. So not the type locality, that means
let me say here, not just type, but holotype. Not the locality where the holotype was collected. Electotype. Now I've talked a little bit about what happens when you lose the original material. You could designate one of the isotypes as serving as a replacement for the holotype, or second the syntype. But sometimes all this stuff has been lost. And you have only some materials that were called the we call the lectotype. So a lectotype then is going to be something that was um, mat original material seen by the author of the name. Okay, so he's seen that material and he choos chooses it to serve as the type when there's no holotype. So it could be from the syntypes, that would be the best. It could also be from other material if all the syntypes have been lost. So you're wondering, under what conditions could we lose these really important specimens like the holotype? Well, there's a number of conditions that unfortunately have all happened. At the time of World War II, the center of botanical work in the whole world was in Berlin. When we talk about the history of taxonomy and the history of botanical taxonomy, we'll talk a good deal about Berlin and the people who worked there. Something really horrible happened. A lot of horrible things happened in World War II. From a botanical scientific standpoint, the horrible thing was that the Berlin Herbarium was bombed. And virtually all of the holotypes that were deposited in the Berlin Herbarium were lost. So it burned and bombed, burned, and destroyed. So now, all of the repositories for many of the names that had been coined in Berlin didn't exist anymore, and new type specimens had to be created. In some times, you might have had a isotypes you could designate or a syntype you could designate, and when you do, you called those things uh, lectotypes. A lectotype was material that has been designated to serve as the repository of the name. It should be material originally seen by the author. And again, how would we know it's a lectotype? Again, there would be a publication, and it says, because of this horrible thing that has happened, I am going back and I am selecting, I, and I an expert in the field, am going back and am selecting new types to serve as the types that were destroyed, and then you would put in lectotypes with a colon and list the lectotype for that, lectotype for that specific name. And that herbarium then would label those plants, those herbarium specimens as serving as the new repository for the name, as the lectotype. So these are new repositories for the names when there's a problem. Next kind of types. Notice that lectotype was original material seen by the author, a neotype it's non-original material. So sometimes, and this is true of, more true of the collections that were made in the 18th century than of now, um, all the material is lost. All the mater original material that was seen by the author is lost. Um, he, and in this case it's almost always he, was an explorer in Borneo, he ships all of his specimens back by ship. He remains there a little bit longer to continue his collections. The ship is lost. All of his original material is lost. And so there are no uh, syntypes, no isotypes, no holotypes, no original material. A lectotype cannot be designated. We still need a repository for the name. And so a neotype is, is chosen. So, and that sometimes the neotypes have to be chosen based on descriptions. So the guy out in Borneo wrote a description of the plant, sometimes they're really bare bones, wrote a description of the plant, and um, that has to be used then to figure out what he meant when he collected that plant. We've lost his collections. That new repository of the type is called a neotype. 
The last type of type is the paratype. So a paratype is something that is used in contemporary studies more than it was used in the past. So we recognize now that all species have some variability in them. And authors want to record somewhat something of this variability when they define a species. So they can collect additional material to represent that variability. And then when they publish the species name, they can list the number of these other herbarium specimens and say, look, I think these are all part of the same species, but they are somewhat variable. According to me, they still all belong to the same species. And how does someone um, formally recognize that variability in a publication? Well, they designate paratypes. Again, these are herbarium specimens that are collected usually by the author, and they're deposited in different herbaria, and then the author in their publication puts the little word paratypes and lists where the paratypes are, and then you can go and look at them and see what that author thinks, um, what, how much variability the author thinks that species has. When we finish all of our discussions of nomenclature, we'll go back and look at some practical examples, some real examples of how these terms have been used, and we will look at an example where an author has designated paratypes. So types exist for all of the ranks up to family. Linnaeus described a species, Borrego officinalis, and there is a type specimen for this. That type specimen is also the type specimen for the genus Borrego. So not is it, only is it the type for the species, it is the type for the genus. And that same type specimen is the type specimen for the family for Agenaceae. Now it might seem a little weird to have a type specimen for a whole family of plants, sometimes thousands of plants, but there you go. That's how nomenclature works. There is a single type specimen for that. In this case, the specimen collected by Linnaeus. Okay, we're still on the <clears throat> principles of plant nomenclature. A very important principle is the priority of publication. So priority of publication, that means that the name that is described first, or the first person who uses that name, gets legitimacy. So the legitimate name, we're going to use that word quite a bit, legitimate. The legitimate name is the earliest, that's principle of priority, is the earliest one that is constructed according to the rules. So this new principle, number three, is the one, is the principle that says it has to be the earliest. Well, what are the rules? Well, they're the rules that we've covered in a different video. The name has to be properly constructed in Latin grammar. When you publish it, it the, the rank has to be indicated. A type specimen has to be designated, preferably a holotype. A description of the plant has to be written prior to 2011 in Latin, after 2011 in English, and the name has to be effectively published, published in a place where other botanists can get it. Those rules, those five things, are what it means to be in agreement with the rules. So the legitimate name is the one that follows those rules and is the earliest name. So the earliest name is. So if another guy comes along in Costa Rica, was our example, and he collects that same plant that our first taxonomist did, 
and gives it another, a different name. And even though he follows all of the rules for effective publish, publication, he properly constructs the name, all of those things, he is number two. And so that name, that name that the hexonymous number two found is not a legitimate name. So the legitimate name is the one that follows the rules and is the earliest name for that plant. Very important to remember that, legitimate. So we've got a summary of that here. It's the first name is the legitimate one. Priority, when does it go back to? It goes back to Linnaeus. In 1753, he published the work Species Plantarum, which is the first use of binomial nomenclature, kind of. Wait to the history lectures and you'll see that it's not quite true, but um, kind of semi-true. In any case, we go back to Linnaeus for the first use of legitimate name. So if you use a name before 1753, doesn't count. Anything after 1753, the first person who uses a name's a taxon gets to name it. Now, the principal priority works in many, many conditions. Most of the conditions are covered by it. But there's a few weird conditions where it doesn't work very well. Um, so I'll try to give an example of one of those. We'll look at some real examples when we come to the practical part of these lectures. It doesn't work in the case where, let's say you've got a plant that everyone thinks its name is uh, Planta Communis, and everyone's been calling it that for the last hundred years. But prior to it being called Planta Communis, it was called Planta Virginiana. And it was called that in a very obscure publication that was published in a journal of the Virginia Botanical Society in 1754. I'm just making this all up. And no one knew about it until hundreds of years later and someone described, found out that it, this plant has a different name. And by the rules of nomenclature, we should change the name to Plantus Virginiana instead of Plantus Communis. However, you know, Plantus Communis is a favorite backyard plant. Everyone's growing it in their gardens. It, everyone knows it. I mean, people at the supermarket almost know this scientific name. It is so far, so much in common use that it would just create havoc if the darn taxonomist changed the name. So there's a way to preserve the new name, and that is at the Botanical Congress, IBC, International Botanical Congress, at those nomenclature sections we talked about. Someone can propose that we conserve that name. I'm talking about a species name, so there can be a conserved species name. And so what happens then is that someone writes a proposal to the Botanical Congress, to the nomenclature section, and they say, oh yeah, I agree, the correct name for this plant is Plantus virginiana. But everyone knows it as Plantus communis, and this name is such in such wide use that I believe we should preserve the name, we should conserve the name Plantus communis over the true name Plantus virginiana. And the nomenclature section then votes on it, and they can decide to approve that proposal or not approve that proposal. And sometimes they're approved. approved. And so you can look at the very back of the International Botanical Code, International Code of Nomenclature, and there's a list of names that have been conserved, and a list of names that have been proposed for conservation have been, have been rejected. So a record is kept then of these conserved names. There can also be conserved generic names, and there can be conserved family names, and they're all listed in the International Code. So names of families and so on, and species. So we're going to go down here from family, A-C-E-A-E, -E, to subfamily, I-D-E-A-E, -E, to this is genus. Here is species. Here is subspecies. And we can go on down from that for variety, et cetera. 
notice something interesting about these. In all of these cases, we have this name after the name of the species or the genus or the family. This is the taxonomist who named that taxon. person who gets credit for coining the name. So it's the person who followed the rules and named that taxon first. We'll talk more about these, the really importance of having this name, uh, the name of the taxonomist associated with the taxon name as we go on. I want to note a couple things here. Sometimes there are two names here one name in parentheses and one name not in parentheses. So there's a parenthetical authority and another authority here. We are going to come back to this. I just want you to note it for now. We will come back to it in another lecture and talk about what's going on with these two names. Second thing to notice is that these names are often abbreviated just to make life hard on everybody who is not a working taxonomist. R, B, R for Robert Brown, L for Carlos Linnaeus. Linnaeus had a son who was also working in this. L, Phil for his son. Phyllis, son of Linnaeus. <clears throat> and working taxonomists will know all of these abbreviations, many of the abbreviations that are very common. Fourth fundamental principle, and in many ways the most important one and the hardest one to understand. Let me read it to you. I'll highlight some of the parts and I'll try to explain some of them. Well, I will explain some of them. So we'll walk through it in some detail. Fundamental principle, each taxon of a particular circumscription, position, and rank can have only one correct name in each treatment, the earliest in accordance with the rules. Each taxon of a particular subscription, circumscription, position, and rank can have only one correct name in each treatment, the earliest one in accordance with the rules. Okay, what in the world is going on with this? So we know what a taxon is. Let's just assume we're working at the species level. Circumscription. What does a circumscription mean? Well, let us say we have a species that occurs all up and down the Atlantic coast. It's got a range something like this. And a taxonomist comes along. We're going to call them taxonomist one. And they say, this is all one species. And they give it a name. We'll just say it's called Planta Virginiana. That is a circumscription. Now I've made it very graphic here by drawing a circle around it, but circumscription means drawing a circle around. Remember paratypes? Paratypes were a way of defining the variation within a species when it was first described. Eventually what that taxonomist is doing by designating paratypes is they're circumscribing the species. They're circumscribing what 
organisms, that new name belongs to it. They're saying that. that. Let us say that there is another taxonomist who comes along. And that taxonomist looks at this same data and they say, ah, I think the southern populations of this species are different than the northern ones. And so our tax second taxonomist, we're going to call him taxonomist two, says that there are two species here. Same data, different interpretation. And he gives them two separate names. He says the northern one is Planta, I'm just going to abbreviate it with P. Philadelphicus or Philadelphiana. And the southern one Planta Caroliniana. So he has described, circumscribed, two taxa in the area that the first one described one taxa. So there are two different circumscriptions. So that means there's two different ways of naming this species. I just want you to keep that in mind. In fact, one person says it's not one species, and one person says it is one species. Okay, so each taxon of a particular circumscription can have only one correct name. Well, okay, we're okay with that, right? So each of those taxonomists, taxonomist one, says, yeah, well, it's all one species and it's got one correct name. There it is, Planta virginiana. Taxonomist 2 says, yeah, well, it's all two species and it's got two correct names, but, you know, that's because it's two species, not because it's one species. It's got a different circumscription, so that's okay, too. They're both right, according to this fundamental principle. These both taxonomists now are right. You're wondering how we're going to sort this out. We'll get to that. In each treatment, So, both of these guys write books about this. They write taxonomic work. So, first of all, let's say there are here there are two circumscriptions. There are going to be two publications. A publication, each treatment. There's our publications. So in each treatment, there is only one correct name for each circumscription. We're still okay. We've got taxonomist one in their publication. They say it's all one species, one circumscription, one name. Taxonomist two says it's Two different species, each species has one circumscription, two different names. No one has violated these rules. And now, the last part, which is not going to solve all the problems for us, but here it is, the earliest in accordance with the rules. That is, the earliest legitimate name. Now again, look at these names, they're different. Right? Planta virginiana, Planta philadelphiana, Planta caroliniana. They're different names. So all of those names could be published in these works and could be legitimate. The only place we would find if there was a problem, let's say Taxonomist 2 came down and they said, uh, 
let's say they said this, this, this circumscription here, taxonomist number two, this is P. virginiana. Now we have a problem. We've got two uses of the name Planta virginiana. One is the red circumscription, one is the upper blue circumscription, and only one of those can be, um, can be legitimate. The earliest one is legitimate, and the other one has to be thrown out. But taxonomist number two was smart enough not to do that, did not do this. So the names that they've got are okay. So the result is two treatments and two opinions. on how these organisms should be named. And this fundamental principle is not violated by this. This actually is what the principle says. For each taxon, for each of this group of real organisms in the world, of a particular circumscription, three different circumscriptions here, so three different names, there can be only one correct name, one for each circumscription, in each treatment, and so each circumscription has those two treatments, but one, has, one treatment has one name, one treatment or has two names, and that has to be the earliest in accordance with the rules. In these case, these are all in accordance with the rules. No one's grouped that up. So this is okay. That's a weird, isn't it? We'll let you think it's weird for a while because it is. Okay, so. In each work, There can be only one correct name, notice we're using this word correct, not legitimate, one correct name for each taxon and circumscription. should really kind of say taxon slash circumscription. And that correct name is the one that is the earliest legitimate name. for that taxon and circumscription. So those names have to be legitimate. They have to be a follow, follow the rules. There has to be a clear circumscription. You have to say exactly what your names are applying to. And it has to be the earliest, legitimate and the earliest one. 
So I've just restated what this fundamental principle says. So if we understand this principle right, what it means is that, let's say you could pick up two booklets, two floras. And let's take an example. You could pick up Smalls. Small was a botanist in the southeastern United States, and he wrote a flora of the southeast. You pick up Smalls' flora of the southeast, and you could pick up Weekly's new 2020 flora of the southeast. And you could look up a given group in that, in those two floras, and you could find that Small circumscribed this taxon in a certain way, and Weekly circumscribed it in a different way. And they called them different names. And they are both correct. Yeah, they are both correct because they follow this principle. They're legitimate, the circumscriptions are different, all the rules were followed, they used the earliest name for that circumscription, they're both correct. It's a weird situation, I know. You'll get your head around it. I know you're asking another question about this. We're going to come to that question in a second. Before we do, scientific names are treated as Latin. It's the fifth principle. We know it already. It's nothing really surprising here. I don't really know why they made this five instead of four because four is so important, really, it should be number one. But, okay, scientific names are treated as Latin. In order to be legitimate, they have to be Latin, too. Then the sixth part, rules and regulations of the International Code are retroactive. So they can change the rules and they appear and they apply to all names that were in the past. And it, it takes a little bit of thought, but when you think about it, it has to be this way. They have to be retroactive to be effective. So let's just remove, remember what legitimate names are. Legitimate names are in follow the rules of the code, the rules of the code, those rules of the code, right? Properly constructed Latin grammar, rank has to be indicated, there has to be a type specimen designated, description of the plant has to be in English if after 2011, and it has to be effectively published. Make sure you know those five rules, they're very important. Illegitimate names, they violate one of those rules. They violate one or more of those rules. And there's plenty of examples of those in the botanical history of literature. Those are legitimate and illegitimate names. What's a correct name? Okay, so to be correct, it has to be legitimate. And it has to be adopted by a particular author. We talked about Small's Flora and Weekly's Flora. It's adopted by an author, a legitimate name. Those guys say, okay, it's legitimate, and I think it's right, and I published it in my book. So it has to be legitimate and earliest, I should say. Legitimate and earliest. Legitimate name and earliest name, and adopted by an author. That's what correct means. So that's very important to remember. Correct, the word correct has a very specific scientific meaning, taxonomic meaning. And it means these things. It is a legitimate name. It is the earliest published name for that circumscription. And it is adopted by an author. That's what correct means. It doesn't mean anything else in that. That's what it means. Okay, let's look at the next statement. Two or more alternate legitimate names. Yeah, so different authors could have different legitimate names because, because of different circumscriptions. But, only one of those names can be correct. So they can only be correct because you can't publish a work and say, okay, this plant is called Planta virginiana, and then on the next page you say, this same plant that you just called Planta virginiana is called Planta caroliniana. You can't do that. I mean, that's not, that's not correct. No one would think that was correct. So only one can be correct. 
even though the names are legitimate. So we can have legitimate names, but names that are not correct. And so we've answered that last question. How can a name be legitimate but not correct? Legitimate because it follows the rules, not correct because an author does not use it. So small weekly did not use small's names. Weekly is saying small's names for certain taxa are not correct. Legitimate but not correct. So you should be able to answer that question now. How can a name be legitimate but not correct? And you might want to spend some time writing that out. It's not completely intuitive. And because it's not really intuitive, we're going to do it again. So each taxon can have only one correct name in a given work. So into a flora or key or revision, any kind of publication, it can have one correct name. But there can be more than one legitimate name. What's a correct name? Correct name, earliest published name, principal priority, remember that. And it's got to be legitimate, it's got to follow the rules, and it's got to be adopted by a particular author. Those are our three principles we've covered already. So a legitimate name, earliest possible name, adopted by a given author. That's correct. Those three things mean correct. What the word correct means. So only one correct name in a given flora, and but there can be alternate legitimate names. And later on when we talk about practical cases, we're going to talk about this guy here. This is, aha, well what is this? It is either Aristolochia or it is Isotrema. Both names are legitimate. Both <clears throat> names have been published in botanical works. They're both correct. And so, make sure that you can answer these questions. Describe the process of valid publication. That's that five-step process we've gone over a number of times. Make sure you know what a correct name is, and make sure how you know you, what you how you that you know how a name can be legitimate, but not correct. And now we come to the question that's been bugging you: Which name is right? Yeah, this is the question of science. We now have different opinions, small versus weekly, on what is the correct circumscription of certain taxa. Who is right? Well, the good news and the bad news is that it's up to you, a trained scientist, to make a decision on what you're going to use, on what is right. Now, it's always going to be what is right for you and for your purpose. You can't say, this name is right, and I'm going to go get my guns, and I'm going to make sure that everyone else agrees with me that it's right. That's not what science is done, and that's not how science is done, and that's not what right means. Right means, in science, that you, as a scientist, make an informed decision about how you're going to use other people's work. And you're going to look at the work of small, and you're going to look at the work of right, of um, small and weekly, and you're going to make a decision which is the better circumscription. And there may be cases where you say small was had a better idea here, and there may be cases where you say weekly was here. Because you don't have to accept everything that's in a flora. And in, you can say, I'm going to take this piece out of this flora and this piece out of this flora, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to call them those things. I mean, that's un Fortunate and unfortunate, that's the way that it works. There is no governing body that votes on which name is right. You are now, as you finish this course, going to be in a position to start making your own decisions about what is a good circumscription, what is a good legitimate name. It has to be legitimate, but what is a correct name is what I mean to say. Okay, so basically each individual scientist gets to decide what's right. Now that's overwhelming, right? You can't go through these two floors. I mean, you can't just sit down, well, I better make a decision on every taxon that exists in the southeastern United States and decide which name is right. No, you know, no scientist does that. So normally we would do, uh, you would say, well, for this class we are going to follow weekly's use of all these taxon names. And we'll 
do that. If I'm teaching in the southeastern United States, I would almost always follow weekly. It's the most up-to-date recent work. And even though there are places where I don't agree with him, when I've looked closely at it, I say, ah, for the purposes of this course, for what I'm trying to do, we're just going to use Weekly's interpretation of all these taxa. They're pretty darn good, and my small quibbles with certain of his decisions are minor in comparison with the enormity of his contribution of make, putting together a floor in the Southeast, the first one that's been done in over 100 years. Well, the activity is governed by the code. Naming new taxa, we did that in a previous video. Determining the legitimate name for previously named taxa that have been divided, united, transferred, or changed in rank. We are going to do that in another video, in the next one. The code doesn't tell you which name is correct. The code is about rules, about laws. So the code is like our laws. So follow the code. Other taxonomists take your work seriously. Don't follow the code. Other people don't. It is up to each individual taxonomist to decide whether they are going to use the work of a taxonomist who did not follow the code. And most taxonomists will say they are not going to.